So, this week we've done a lot of rules for calculus. We've proven that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. Same works with the difference. Uh, we've proven that you can pull out scalars. Uh, we've proven a product rule. It's not the derivative of the product of the product of the derivatives, but some funky formula. We've proven a quotient rule, which is even funkier. And we've proved a chain rule, which is closer what we want for it. Why did you do the C times that? Oh, hmm? This is saying yeah, yeah, yeah. if you take the derivative of a constant times a function, mm -hmm. it's the same as taking the derivative of the function and multiplying by the constant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we built up a whole bunch of rules. And then yesterday, we worked a lot of examples. Oh, I was wrapped up the power rule. And we proved this power rule now for any rational number. Basically, for any fraction, which of course includes all the integers. And we did, remember, we did that in several steps. Okay. So now we seem to be in really good shape. Whenever we have some sort of polynomial or rational function, which we call quotient polynomials, or if we have negative exponents and we're only talking about you know, rational exponents. But there are other functions out there that are you know, worthwhile to talk about. And so today, we're going to talk about trigonometric functions. derivatives. So let's do it. We want to compute our, our, our main goal It's going to turn out that in the process of computing the derivative of sine of x, we're going to have to come up with a few facts about limits of, uh, of the sine function. And we're going to need to use a, a rather intricate geometric argument. Uh, the upshot is that we'll then be able to compute the derivative of cosine using the exact same arguments. And once we get sine and cosine, then all the other trigonometric functions are going to follow from the quotient rule. So we'll be in good shape. So computing sine of x and its derivative rather is this is this is that's why it's the main goal. It'll pretty much give us everything else. Okay, well how do we compute a derivative? Well when you don't have you know some way of breaking it down into easier functions, right, using the rules, okay, you actually have to go back to the definition. Okay, so we're back to the limit. So we need to compute the limit as h goes to 0, sine of x plus h minus sine of x over h. Okay. So, sine of x plus h, this is sine of a sum. Right? There's a formula for breaking that up, so we'll use that. Well, 
we try to do the only, I mean, we do the only thing we can do at this point. We try to factor it a little bit. So let's see. Uh, this has a sine of x, and that has a sine of x. So we can factor it. At least that a little bit. So these two are going to combine to be sine of x times this, uh, cosine of h minus 1. So I pull a sine of x from here, that leaves a cosine of h. I pull a sine of x from here, that leaves a minus 1. And I'm going to write this over h. Okay, so I'm actually going to split this up. So if these two can combine, everything is over this one h. Okay, so I'm going to split this up into two fractions, both over h. Okay, and then the second one is, well, just this term remaining. I'm going to write it like this. You'll notice the reason I write it like this is because now these terms that come out front, the sine of x and the cosine of x, they have no h. Okay, so as far as this limited h goes to zero is concerned, these are just constants. So if I want to break up this limit, because I have a limit of a sum, if I want to break it up, I just need to show that these individual limits exist. And these things are just constants, and we know constants get pulled out of limits. So all I need to show is what, that these two limits exist. So I need to determine what the limit as h goes to 0 of this is. Now, as h goes to 0, cosine goes to what? 1. 1. OK, so this goes to 1 minus 1, which goes to 0. And this goes to 0 on the bottom. Ooh. And this one, as, sine, as h goes to 0, what happens to sine of h? 0. Goes to 0. And h goes to 0. Ooh. OK, so it's not, you know, it's just not so easy, right? We're going to have to actually think about this. How do we, how do we compute one of these? OK, well, let's, let's start with this one. This one looks a little bit easier. Okay, so we want to compute. <coughs> limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h. OK. Well, there's two cases that you have to deal with, of course, whenever you're computing a limit. Right? When it's a two-sided limit, you have to compute what? Both left and right. the left and right, right? The one-sided limit. Well, let's compute, say, the, the right limit. So, so here I can assume that h is greater than 0, and it doesn't hurt to assume that it's less than pi over 2. Because, I mean, h is supposed to get really, really small. Okay, so it's certainly less than pi over 2 when it gets really, really small. Okay. So we're going to draw a picture, and we're going to appeal to your geometric, geometric intuition. So let's start with the unit circle. So it's a unit circle, so we know all the radii, radii are one, and length one. And let me see, I'll just give names to everything. The center will call O. This point we'll call A. Here, this point we'll call B. Okay, and then let me drop this line. So this is perpendicular here. Okay, and I'll call the point where it intersects C. And we'll call this angle here H.
Okay, now, let's make two quick observations. First, what is the length of this line segment B to C? That is, what's the distance from B to C? One, one minus one, one squared, which is one minus one. Let's be careful, right? So this, this whole distance here is one, not just from zero oh. to C. So we, we, of course, we could compute it in terms of this distance from O to C. But we have another way to compute it, namely, well, the sine of this angle is okay. this opposite over the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse is 1. So it's just the sine of this angle. All right, well, the length of this is the sine of this angle. Right. So we know that sine of H is equal to the distance from B to C. Okay. On the other hand, okay, let's say I draw in this line. Now this is a nice right triangle that I get. And of course, you would agree that if you have two legs in any triangle, right, in a right triangle, then the hypotenuse is longer than either of the legs. Okay. So we know that whatever the distance from B to C is, it's less than the, the distance from B to A. Okay. So this is less than the distance from B to A. Okay. Now, would you also agree that the distance from B to A on this line is less than the distance from B to A if I follow this arc? Sure, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So if you take another route, it's got to be longer. Okay, how long is this distance from B to A? One. The arc time. Well, I like the idea because it's an arc. <laughs> okay, so arc sine, of course, is just the inverse of the sine function. Um, and so it's, it's not actually... Well, I mean, the answer will be the arc sine is something. We can, we can, it's, uh, the answer is much easier. Well, let's talk about radian measure for a second. What's the measure of the whole circle? 2 pi. What's, if you have a unit circle, what's the circumference of the circle? 2 pi, right? It's 2 pi r, right? Of course, r is 1 in this case, so it's 2 pi. Okay. Let's say you look at just a 90 degree angle. That's pi over 2. Right? What's the distance around a quarter of the circle? Pi over 2, right? It's 2 pi divided by 4. It's pi over 2. Radiant measure just says you take this angle, and that's just the length of the, the, uh, the arc. Right? It's just the same thing. So the length of this arc is also h. So in particular, the distance from b to a is less than h. Okay. So this tells us that the sine of h is less than h. Yeah, that's kind of neat. Right? The sine is actually always less than the angle. Another way to say this if I divide both sides by h, since h is positive, I don't lose, I don't have to change any signs around. If I divide sine by h, this is less than 1. Okay? Cool. I have a bound on, on this. This dip. So, for instance, right, we looked at this and said, okay, if h goes to 0, this is going to 0, and this is going to 0. And sometimes, if both top and bottom are going to 0, it might actually, be, the limit might be 0, and sometimes it might be infinity, right? Because that bottom is going to 0. But this is already telling us, no, it's definitely not going off to infinity. This, this function is certainly staying small. Okay? Let's try to bound it from the other side. So here's where we do something a little more complicated geometry. I'm going to start drawing the tangent lines to the to this circle at B and at A. And then 
let me take this line that goes from O to B and just keep extending it. Okay, I want to mark a couple of points. So this is where the two tangent lines intersect. I'm going to call that E. And this is where this line and the tangent at A intersect, and I'll call that D. Now I have a lot going on here, so it becomes harder to see. Let's, let's do our best. Okay. So let's again, let's look at uh, this h, which of course we know is also the distance, right, from b to a. All right, so I claim here that h is less than the distance from A to E plus the distance from E to B. So if I'm going from B to A via this arc, all right, that's shorter than if I go to E first and then down to A. Now, if I go from E to B, okay, oh, mind you, okay, so here's an observation. This is a, from geometry. If you take a circle and you draw a radius from that circle, and then you draw the tangent line, the tangent line and the radius are perpendicular to each other. Okay. Okay, so this is, okay, maybe no. So this is a right angle, and this is a right angle. Okay, which means that this triangle here, B, D, E, is a right triangle again. Which means that the hypotenuse of the right triangle is longer than the legs. So from B to E is shorter than from D to E. So the distance from A to E plus the distance from E to B is less than the distance from A to E plus the distance from E to D. Okay, and of course the distance from A to E plus the distance from E to D, that's just this line here. Right. So it's just going straight up. So I just write this. What is the distance from A to B? What can we say about this distance? Well, let's think in terms of trigonometric functions again. Okay, we, we have this angle H, and we want to talk about this side here, and we have a big right triangle. Because right? again, this was a tangent line to this radius here, so they form a right triangle. I mean, they form a right angle, and they're right triangle. So we know that the tangent of this angle is the opposite, which is the line we want, over the adjacent, which we know has length 1. OK, so you divide by 1, nothing happens. So this line here is just equal, the length of it is just the tangent of it. And of course, tangent of h is equal to sine of h over cosine of h. Okay, fine. What if now I take this cosine, right, so I have h less than sine of h over cosine of h. I'm going to move the cosine over here and the h under here. And everything is positive because we're in the first quadrant. So this implies that, let's see, cosine of h is less than sine of h over h. Okay, remember, sine of h over h is the quantity we're looking at. That's what we want. So that's why we took 
took this cosine of h and moved it over here and took the h and put it over here. But we also know that sine of h over h is less than 1. <sighs> okay. Why, why did we do all this? Well, remember, I want to know something about this function, sine of h over h, as h goes to 0. I have now squeezed it between two functions. Okay. And what happens as h goes to 0 to these outside functions? Well, what's the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine of h? 1. And what's the limit as h goes to 0 of 1? 1. Aha. So I have two functions which bound my middle function. And as h goes to 0, these functions both go to 1. What does the squeeze theorem tell us then? The squeeze theorem says now we know that the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over So this is, I mean, it's funny, is I mean, this is just you know, geometry and a little trigonometry, you know, but it's useful. You, know, you can actually do something. But I mean, this is a hard argument, right? Yeah, I wouldn't expect anybody in here to come up with this on their own. It's not easy. Okay. So we know that this limit here is going to be 1. So first, this limit exists. And second, it's going to equal 1. Okay. What about this limit? You think we did all that, and we only got one of them? Two. My goodness, this next one must be even harder. Okay, so let's hope it's not. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to evaluate this one. Cosine of h minus one over h. Okay, so you guys have had some experience with. Computing limits. What do you think we could try? I mean, just in what you've done, what would be the, the first thing you might try? Well, think about when we had, if this cosine was a square root, what would you do? If it was square root of h minus one. You remember you you multiply by the oh, conjugate. Yeah. Why don't we try that? Okay, so you do that because okay, you get the difference of squares, so you'll get cosine squared of h minus one. And on the bottom, well now it's not so nice, you get h times cosine of h plus 1. Okay, now we have a cosine squared and we have a 1. That should make you think, yeah, somehow sine squared should be in here too, right? Because we know that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Okay, so let's see. If we have cosine squared minus 1, what does that equal? Sine squared. Is it sine squared? No. Negative sine squared. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. Let's see, if you do cosine squared theta and you subtract 1, that means you move the 1 over, means you have to move the sine squared over. And of course, you picked up a negative when you did that. Okay, so this on top is just going to be negative sine squared. What should we do next? Just 
distribute the h. Okay, well let's think ahead. We're going to get h cosine of h plus h. Hmm. No, it doesn't seem to be very helpful. Hmm. What about cosine h plus 1? I cannot put it there. I don't see what to do with cosine of h plus 1. made a theta. It should be an H. Alright. What do we do? I don't remember. I do remember it doesn't require a geometric argument. and then turn the camera back on, you can come up and solve the problem. Okay. All right, first I have a minus. Okay. I claim I can pull that out. Okay. Now I'm going to split this up into two fractions. They get multiplied together. First one is going to be sine of h over h times sine of h over cosine of h plus 1. Okay, so I haven't done anything other than right, taking this fraction. Okay, a minus came out, but we're not worried about that with limits so much. Okay, and then sine of h times sine of h over cosine of h plus 1. If you multiply those, you can get exactly this. That's what a minus sign is. Now, I'm only allowed to pull this minus out if this limit exists. Okay, why does this limit exist? Well, I claim you can break this limit up into two different limits. Right? And of course, that only, only makes sense to do if both those limits exist. But we just evaluated this limit. The limit as h goes to 0 sine of h over h. That's what we computed. Oh, I, you know, I, I forgot to mention what happens when you go to the negative. So we'll just go back and cover that in a second. Okay. But in any case, assuming that I've, I've shown it also works for for the left-sided limit, then we know that this limit will exist in D1. And what's this limit? Well, the h goes to 0, this goes to 0, and this goes to 2. Okay, there's no problem. That exists. It's 0. So I can break this up. Right? The minus can come out, this becomes 1, this becomes 0, so what's the limit? 0. Right? Negative 1 times 0. So, this limit will of course exist as a constant. This limit we just proved is 0. This limit will exist as a constant. This limit we proved was 1. So, what's the limit? Sine times 0 plus cosine times 1. Cosine. Good. So, this proves that the derivative of sine is cosine. Nice. Okay, Let, let's just go back very briefly and, and finish this off. All right, what happens as h goes to 0 from the negative side? Well, from the negative side, you have, let's say you keep h as a positive number, all right, and then uh, I put a negative in front of it, and that'll make it a small negative number. Okay, so let's just, go, just add a little bit right here. If I have sine of negative h, over negative h. So this is how I make h a small negative number by putting a negative in front of a small positive number. Well, sine of a negative angle is just the negative of the sine. Okay, and it's because sine is an odd function. Okay, 
And remember, an odd function meant that, okay, f of negative x is negative f of x. Okay, but now these negatives cancel. All right, so you're back to the exact same situation, right? We're now, so here, h is positive. And so if we start with a negative angle, which is pretty close to zero, we can, the, the different sine of h over h is actually just, or sine of negative h over negative h is really just the same as sine of h over h. Because sine of h is an odd function, and h is an odd function. If you divide an odd function by an odd function, you get an even function. An even function says that f of minus x is f of x, right? Minus x doesn't change anything. So the other limit, the limit from the other side has to. Okay. So we have now computed the derivative, and it's equal to cosine of x. Okay. So once again. We've done a lot of work to prove one little statement, which I could have just told you, of course. That's what, that's what Kevin asked me to do all the time, just tell us the answer. You'd hear better without the thing in your ear. Okay, so, but now the hope is that having done all of this work, we don't have to do a whole lot of more work than the rest of the story. So let's, let's record what it is that we now know. And we'll try to use that to prove more. Okay, so we proved that the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h is 1. We prove that the limit of h goes to 0 of cosine of h minus 1 over h is 0. And we prove that the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Okay. Well, the next thing, of course, we want is to compute the derivative of cosine of x. There's nothing yet, but it's pretty close. Let's again plug in the definition of the derivative. Okay, we'll just pretend this was a sine function. Last time when we made a sine, we used the, the angle sum formula to break it up. Well, now we have a cosine, so we have a different formula, but same idea. Cosine of x, cosine of h, minus sine of x, sine of h, and then minus cosine of x. So it's using the, the angle sum formula for cosine. Again, I do the only thing I can think to do, which is to factor. And I notice that the first term and the last term both have a cosine of x in them. So I'll factor that out. And again, I'm going to split it up into two different fractions over h. And I'll write it so that the constants kind of come out and are not involved in those fractions. So I get cosine of x times cosine of h minus 1 over h, and then minus sine of x times sine of h over h. So it's really, it's, I mean, it's exactly the same thing as we did for sine. The upshot is that, well, 
we again end up with this limit that we'd like to break up. Right? These two things are constants as far as h is concerned. So again, we have to evaluate these limits. But unlike with sine, where we didn't know those limits, now we know what those limits are. So we can just write it down. So let's see. OK, cosine of x is cosine of x. This limit is 0 minus sine of x times 1. So we just get minus sine of x. OK, so that's our derivative. That's not bad, right? We were able to reuse some of our work. This is always very nice. Okay. What's the derivative of tangent? Secant. Secant. Squared. Okay, so of course this is pre knowledge, right? Did that all in my head real quick. Quotient rule, yes. Okay, so I hear quotient rule being said. Why use quotient rule on this? Why don't we just plug it right back into the definition of the derivative? You're all rolling your eyes like, are you crazy? <laughs> Why use a definition of the derivative if you don't have to? Okay, that's fair enough. We know that the tangent function is sine over cosine. So if we want to compute the derivative of tangent, we can use the quotient. says you do low times the derivative of high. Okay. The derivative of sine, we just saw was cosine. You get a cosine squared. Minus <coughs> high times the derivative of low. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. So that makes that a plus, and we get times squared. Over the square of the denominator, so we get cosine squared. Wait, I thought you guys said it would be secant squared. We got all this garbage on top. Identity? What do you, what do you mean identity? Oh, right! Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Sweet. Of course, 1 over cosine squared is the same as secant squared. All right. Very cool. OK. There's three more. Might as well do them. It's good practice. So let's see, sine usually corresponds to cosecant. So we'll do that one. Okay, so what will be the derivative of cosecant? Well, how should we attack it? One over sine. Yeah, cosecant is one over sine. So we can use the quotient rule again. And it should even be easier. We have a one on top. All right, so we do low times the derivative of pi. What's the derivative of one? Zero. Minus pi times the derivative of low. Derivative of sine is cosine. Over square of sine. All right, so this first term just goes away. And you get minus cosine of x over sine squared of x. And 
Yeah, that's not a very nice looking answer. How can I rewrite this? Well, how about this? Write this as minus cosine of x over sine of x times 1 over sine of x. Doesn't that look better? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Well, looks a little better if I take cosine of sine and say that's what? It's cotangent. And 1 over sine is cosecant. Okay, so not as pretty of an answer as the other ones we were getting, but it is an answer. Now you see, derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. Derivative of tangent is secant squared. So shouldn't the derivative of secant be like minus tangent squared? It should be. It's not, but it should be. Intelligent design. <laughs> it's probably bad that that's on tape, isn't it? Nothing. <laughs> All right, so we want to do secant of x. Okay, so this is the same as the derivative of 1 over cosine. Okay, so again, well, quotient rule, same thing every time. Let's see, low times the derivative of 1 minus high times the derivative of cosine is minus sine, so you get a plus, over cosine squared. All right, so we get a sine of x on top, and a cosine squared on the bottom. And since it worked once, we should just try it again. This is sine of x cosine of x times 1 over cosine of x, and the first term is tangent, and the second term is, is secant. Okay. Uh, although I'm going to rewrite this since, uh, actually I probably should do the other one too, just to, I think traditionally when you write these in books, you swap these two terms. Of course, it doesn't matter. So it's kind of neat. When you take the derivative of cosecant, you get another cosecant. And it's multiplied by cotangent, and you pick up a negative. And secant is just secant again times tangent. OK, and then the last one is the derivative of cotangent. Okay, so this is the same as the derivative of cosine over sine. Minus sine squared minus cosine squared. What's that equal? If it was sine squared plus cosine squared, we know what to do, right? Yeah, well, if 
sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, you get minus sine squared minus cosine squared is going to be minus 1. So we get minus 1 over sine squared. So this is the same as minus cosine. from, well, I won't say first principles, but rather basic principles, all the derivatives of the trigonometric functions. Now let's see, pattern-wise, what's going on, what can we do? For, for instance, um, if you know that the tangent to secant squared, let me take the derivative, then the cotangent, okay, you're adding a c, so that turns something without a c into a c, and it adds a negative to it. Uh, the same thing here. The sine goes into a cosine. So here, if you have a C, it should turn, well, it turns a C into a not a C, and it adds a negative. And the same thing happens over here. Uh, here you have a secant, and it becomes secant tangent. And then when you add a C, it changes all the non-Cs into Cs, and adds a negative. So there, there is some sort of pattern here that you can, you can try to, to memorize if you want to memorize these things. Um, I, I have to admit, I know these three. I, I don't memorize those. I just use the patterns to, to help. Well, of course, I know sine and cosine. That's not a hard one. But I, I would just use the patterns. Well, these ones I would just always derive if I needed them. So. Okay. Very good. Any questions on how these things were derived? Is there anything bothering you? Okay. Why don't we do some examples where, well, again, it would be very much like yesterday. Come up with some nasty functions, but now we can throw in trig functions. We can utilize those. All right, let's compute the derivative. squared times cosine of x. Okay. What rule do I need to use here? Product rule. Yeah, my product of function. So I need to do the derivative of, well, it doesn't matter which order I do it, we'll follow this one. Derivative of x squared is 2x times cosine of x plus x squared times the derivative of sine, which is minus sine. So this plus turns into a minus, and into a sine. Okay, not so far. Fine. What about cosine of x squared? What do I have to use for this? Chainal, right? I have a function composed with another function. Okay, so the inside function is x squared, the outside function is cosine. Chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function applied to the inside function. Okay, so the derivative of cosine is minus sine evaluated at x squared times the derivative of the inside function. So that's the derivative of x squared, which is? 2x, right? or if you like, minus 2x sine of x squared. Huh? 
the derivative of, how about tangent of 3x squared over the square root of x plus 4. Woo! A lot going on here. So what's the first rule I need to apply? Quotient rule. Quotient rule, right? I have a quotient of functions. I have to apply the quotient rule. Okay, so I do low. Okay, now I, of course, what's the first thing I really want to do here? Yeah, all right, I want to take this, this bit here and write it as x plus 4 to the 1 half. Okay. So I'll write it that way. x plus 4 to the 1 half times the derivative of the top, which is tangent squared 3x, minus top times the derivative bottom squared, right? Ah, oh, hey, that's not bad, though. Let's just get rid of the square root. Get x plus 4 on the bottom. What's a missing denominator amongst friends? Alright, let's just move this down slightly. Okay, so, what rule am I going to use next here on the derivative of tangent squared of 3x? To use the chain rule. So I, I actually have a composition of three functions this time. Sorry. First, I have the outside, the, I mean, the, really the outside function is x squared. The middle function is tangent of x, and the inside function is 3x. Okay, so let's do it one, though, one step at a time. So we'll just treat the outside function as x squared, and the inside function as says this is going to be 2 times the tangent of 3x times the derivative of tangent of 3x. <coughs> okay, and I better start a long brace and put in a minus because we're going to need another line here. So I get tangent squared of 3x. Okay. And what about the derivative of x plus 4 to the 1 half? Well, that should be really easy now. Well, what do I do? What rule am I using again for that? Power rule and the, and the chain rule, right? Okay, so it's going to be 1 half x plus 4 to the minus 1 half times the derivative of x plus 4. But what's the derivative of x plus 4? One. Just 1. So I don't need to worry about that. So I have that difference, and then of course I divide everything by x plus 4. Okay, there's just one derivative left. So we get x plus 4 to the 1 half times 2 tangent 3x. Times, okay, now the derivative of tangent of 3x. What rule do I need to use on this? I have to use the chain rule again. Okay, so the derivative, the derivative of tangent of 3x, okay, well, let's see. Derivative of tangent is secant squared. So I'm going to get <laughs> secant squared of 3x times the derivative of 3x, which is 3. Okay, and then minus the rest of this garbage. Oh, 
Okay, now there's a little bit of simplification I could do, right? There's maybe some factoring going on here. I could factor out an x plus 4 to the minus 1 half out of this. Uh, would make this look a little bit nicer. But uh, that's algebra, I guess, not calculus. So I leave that to you to have fun with. Questions? It's really not that bad, is it? You just follow the rules. You know? and sometimes you have to kind of peel them away, but you do it. Let's, uh, let's leave those up. Find the equation of the tangent line to the curve f of x equals tangent of x at the point pi over 4 comma 1. First thing, before you check anything, before you compute a derivative or any nonsense, you should make sure that this point is actually on the curve. Okay. What does it mean for that point to be on the curve? Well, there's a yeah. in pi over 4, and you see if it takes out 1. Yeah, it should, tangent to pi over 4 better be 1. Is that true? No. No? I don't know. You don't know? Remember homework 1? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I had this nice table of values for your trigonometric functions. We'll see. Sine of pi over 4 is oh, it's root 2 over 2. And cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So, of course, sine of pi over 4 divided by cosine of pi over 4 is 1. So, okay. At least this, this problem makes sense. If I put down 2 here, this problem wouldn't make any sense for How do we find the equation of a tangent line to a curve? Well, you need a point and a slope to get a, the equation of a line. We have a point. We just need a slope. How do I find the slope of a tangent line to a curve? It's the derivative. Thank you. That's excellent. No. No, no, I don't ask rhetorical questions. Am I awesome or what? <laughs> That's rhetorical. Okay. Uh, all right. As Stephanie said, the slope of a tangent line to a curve is just the derivative at that point. Okay. So we just need to compute the derivative, evaluate it at the point pi over 4, and boom, we know the slope of the tangent line. It's that easy. Derivative is the slope of the tangent line to a curve. Okay, fine. So we know that write it with our prime notation. F prime of x, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative at pi over 4 is therefore secant squared of pi over 4. Okay, now let's see. Secant is what? I mean, one over. It's 1 over cosine, and cosine was of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So 1 over root 2 over 2 is just, when you flip it, you get 2 over root 2. Then you square it. So you get 4 over 2. All right? You get 2 over root 2, and you square it, which just means 4 two. over 2. And 4 over 2 is... We have a slope. Mm. 
So our tangent line is given by y minus 1 equals 2 times x minus pi over 4, or y equals 2x. And right, let's see here, you get minus pi over 2 plus 1. I would probably like to write this as plus 1 minus pi over 2. I'm not sure why I'd like to write it that way, but I would. So, it's cool. Let's, let's say we graph the tangent. <laughs> We know the tangent function has these asymptotes whenever the cosine is zero. Right? It's tangent and sine over cosine. So with cosine zero, you get problems. Cosine was zero always at, right, at pi over two and minus pi over two and three pi over two and minus three pi over two and so forth. So we have here's pi over two. Even an asymptote minus pi over two. Tangent looks like that in between the asymptotes. And of course, it's periodic, so it just does the same thing over and over. But since we're looking at pi over 4, we, don't, we just care about this whole region. So pi over 4 is right in the middle. And we know, in fact, that well, this is probably not drawn to scale, since so that's supposed to be 1. But if we now take this point and we draw the tangent line, we actually know what the equation of that tangent line is. It's y equals 2x plus 1 minus pi over 2. And as long as I've been studying mathematics, it still kills me that you can draw a tangent line to this curve and know what the equation of that line is using such a simple process. I mean, this, I mean, of course, we built in a lot of work into this, but still, that's a very short derivation. I mean, there's a lot of things in math that are much easier somehow that take a lot more work to do. You know, this is, so it's very, very quick. And completing the square usually takes longer than this. You know, and this is a, this is not an easy problem conceptually. I mean, this is not an easy curve to think about, right? And to think, oh, draw a tangent line there and tell me the equation of that line. And this is, I mean, I think this is really quite remarkable that, that this can be done. And it's, you know, you should be proud that you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, there is a new homework set online, and I don't think I added trig functions to it yet, so today I'll put another homework set on, and it will have some exercises you can work on with trig functions. Uh, and I'll also put on a few problems that are like this, finding equations of a tangent line or just the slope of a tangent line, so you get a little practice with that. Uh, next week, well, I haven't decided exactly how we're going to play it. Uh, I, uh, You're still on camera, by the way. Sweet. <laughs> Next week, uh, we're definitely going to talk about implicit differentiation, which we've already talked about a little bit. All right. I mean, it's just a chain rule. There's nothing new, actually. Uh, it's just when you have both x's and y's in your equation, or maybe more. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, derivatives of exponential and logarithmic functions. And if I feel like it, we'll do some inverse trigonometric functions. 
right? Like arc sine and arc cosine. So. That's not a trace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we might, if we have time, we'll, we might also talk about higher derivatives. So I don't think we'll. Yeah. Higher derivatives, I'll tell you very quickly, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, you know, if I take a derivative, that's the derivative. If I take a, another derivative, that's the second derivative. And that's called a higher derivative. It's just a derivative. <laughs> just do it again, you know. So, but it get, in most calculus books, it gets its own chapter for higher derivatives. But I think. I think the people who decided it should be, you know, given its own chapter and given its own name, like higher derivatives, must have been higher mathematicians. Get my drift. Okay.